Will Wall Street prosper again, or will it be downsized and made less profitable? The members of FLIRN have a deep commitment to social justice. Ready for our next challenge? What we're going to ask you to do is smell secret items and identify them. Welcome to Study with the Best, the magazine show about CUNY. I'm Blaine Ferguson. Ever wonder which industries keep New York City economically healthy? Well, CUNY Graduate School of Journalism professor Greg David takes us on a walking tour of the companies that drive our economy. times in the last 50 years, Wall Street has boomed. But we also have to recognize that each time there was a boom, there was a bust. But you know what the fundamental innovation of Wall Street is? Greed. In each time, they paid themselves more and more and more money. That money has cascaded through the city. That money supports city government. That money supports an unprecedented number of cultural institutions and nonprofits. But the question is whether the New York economy can be diversified, whether we can offset Wall Street's ups and downs. I'm Greg David. I run the business journalism program at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. And this is about how New York became such a rich place. You can't overstate the importance of tourism. Tourism has provided a way for the millions of immigrants who've come to New York to climb the city's economic ladder. And it all begins here at the Marriott Marquis. Well, when the Marriott Marquis was built in 1986, Times Square was a disaster. The two subway stations here were the highest crime subway stations in the entire city. Bill Marriott used to visit New York occasionally, and he heard that there was an old hotel in Times Square that had 90% occupancy. Well, nobody in the hotel business can average 90% occupancy. So he decided to build the Marquis. And the Marriott Marquis is the highest grossing hotel in the entire Marriott chain. It does hit 90% occupancy year after year after year. Tourism has replaced virtually every job we've lost in manufacturing since this hotel was built. In the 90s, there was this enormous boom in internet companies in New York. We created something on the order of 50 or 60,000 jobs in the city. DoubleClick is a company that started in Atlanta and was the first company to figure out software for putting ads on the web. But you couldn't do that in Atlanta, you know. All the ad agencies were in New York, so they moved to New York. They became New York's most important internet company. About seven years ago, Google bought DoubleClick. Out of that, they've built this place that employs more than 2,500 people in New York as the internet sector in New York approaches 50, 60, maybe 70,000 jobs again. They're in New York not because we're a tech center, but because they have an internet business that needs all kinds of other skills. In the era of John Lindsay, 
the economy was way down the priority list, and business was seen as a group that should be taxed so that the money could be used to help solve the city's social problems. Well, that got the city in enormous trouble. The 70s were a disaster. New York lost 620,000 jobs in the worst downturn that we've seen in the post-war era. Ed Koch changed that attitude toward business. Rudy Giuliani, of course, drove crime down in New York. That's had a huge impact in allowing us to expand lots of industries. And then Michael Bloomberg came along. And what Michael Bloomberg did is that he ended the myth of manufacturing. And he opened the city to all kinds of new development. This is where we were going to build a stadium to bring the 2012 Olympics to New York. That effort failed. Now the plan is to turn this into the next great neighborhood in New York, another Rockefeller Center. If a few years from now there are apartment buildings and office buildings here, it will mean New York has prospered. It will mean that the city is going to grow past the limit it has been unable to break previously of 3.8 million jobs. But if this land is not developed, it will mean New York is not as prosperous as it has been. Will Wall Street prosper again, or will it be downsized and made less profitable? Is the city diversified enough to survive? The answer is the city is diversified and can prosper without Wall Street, but I'm not sure it can be as rich as it has been or could be. And that's the story I tell in my book, Modern New York, The Life and Economics of the City. Great Moments in CUNY History. The Hall of Fame for Great Americans was the very first Hall of Fame of any kind in America, a little-known non-religious national shrine. It was built in 1900 on what is now the campus of Bronx Community College. The principal feature of this sweeping semicircular arc is a 630-foot open-air colonnade which houses 98 bronze busts of men and women who have distinguished themselves as humanitarians, artists, educators, statesmen, and scientists. The Hall of Fame for Great Americans, part of CUNY, the largest and greatest urban university in the United States. My name is Liliette Lopez. I'm a student at Queens College. I am a double major in political science and urban studies. I was born in Nicaragua. I lost my vision at nine months old due to a childhood accident. Growing up in Nicaragua was very tough because it was a communist government that didn't allow me to attend school. People with disabilities do not have opportunity or no use for the government. I'm just blind. I, that doesn't mean that I couldn't succeed or I couldn't do what other people did. Hostels, I was the first student with a disability to ever run for student government. Why CUNY? Because CUNY has prepared me as a leader, does not tell me what to say and when to say things. I could be my own self. As a person that is studying political science, it, this is very important, that a leader does what he or she wants or feels is right. You know, thanks to all the opportunities that I have gotten in CUNY, it shows you that everyone has an opportunity, that everyone could accomplish dreams, you just have to work hard and believe in yourself. That's me, and that's Kenny. The members of CLEARN have a deep commitment to social justice and are willing to, to put themselves on the line to, to assist people who ordinarily would never have access to high, comp, high quality, competent lawyers. That's the mission of CUNY Law and the reason Fred Rooney helped start the Community Legal Resource Network, or CLEARN. It's a network of about 350 lawyers offering their services at extremely discounted rates. 
We help lawyers to do well so that they in turn can do good. Most New Yorkers go to court without any representation because they can't afford it and most of the free pro bono legal services are overwhelmed. That's the gap Clern fills. Even if the facts are against that person, an attorney being there will change the outcome of that case. That's where 2008 CUNY law grads Joanna Donbeck and Juliet Forstenzer come in. They're part of Clern, and while most lawyers in the network focus on housing and immigration cases, these women chose to start the Health Care Rights Initiative for a very personal reason. I'm 27. I'm scared for my life. I have no idea how much leave time I have. I have no idea if I'm going to survive the year. In 1998, Forstenzer was working full-time in advertising when she was diagnosed with a rare form of uterine cancer. Even though she was fully insured, she couldn't believe the fight and the hassle she had to go through to get pre-approved and covered for the treatment needed to save her life. What happens for people in, in the delay is a stage one cancer turns into a stage three cancer. So even if they survive, their prognosis is worse, their survival rate is worse, their treatment is more radical. After winning the fight for herself, she made it her mission to make sure others didn't have to go through the trauma she did battling big bureaucracies. My sole purpose of going to CUNY Law was to get the tools I needed to empower people who um, have to go into systems that dehumanize them and, and try and change that dynamic. That dynamic could be changed by the lawyer effect, a simple phone call or letter from an attorney. Clern makes that possible and most importantly, affordable. The bills, the bills started becoming enormous. Joyce Griffith thought battling breast cancer would be the fight of her life. The Brooklynite thankfully beat the cancer, but little did she know she'd wind up at war with her insurance company. This was additional stress knowing that you have all these enormous bills that are just mounting up. And then you had the choice of either paying the bills or not eating today, not, you know. Nearly $70,000 worth of bills she thought her insurance was supposed to pay since she was part of a union and working full-time at a nursing home. On the brink of eviction, a housing attorney recommended the Health Care Rights Initiative to her. The attorneys got to work for Griffith, spending nearly 20 hours a week for nearly 10 months combing through paperwork, making phone calls, and trying to right the wrongs against her. Griffith wasn't wrong. Turns out a clerical mistake nearly cost her her home, her livelihood, and 70 grand. It took two attorneys fighting for a woman who is supposed to be insured to uncover the error. Normally, representation like that would cost tens of thousands of dollars at a private law firm. They only charge Griffith $500 for all of their help. I'm very grateful. Very, very grateful. I mean, if, if they weren't there, it, you know, Probably I wouldn't have been here. <laughs> Juliet and Joanna epitomize the lawyer who really puts into practice the concept of law in the service of human needs. And as an institution, CUNY Law is very, very proud of the work that they're doing. Rooney says Clern doesn't just help victims who can't afford representation, it helps the lawyers as well. It assists attorneys who want to start their own firms and gives them a network to fall back on. Since 1998, Clern has grown from a handful of lawyers to several hundred. It's their mission to continue to mentor CUNY grads, provide representation to those in need, and live up to CUNY Law's mission to use law in the service of human needs. More on the way, but first, this message from the Chancellor. Hi, I'm Chancellor Matthew Goldstein, pleased to present CUNY's 2011 Student All-Star Team. In the infield, Barium Goldwater scholar Mark Barriman, National Science Foundation fellows Lena Mercedes Gonzalez and Arthur Jacob Parzignat, and Truman scholar Gareth Rhodes. In the outfield, National Science Foundation scholar Ryan Jaipal, Barium Goldwater scholar Celine Joiry, and Fulbright grant recipient Miguel Guzman. Behind home plate, Truman scholar Iodella O.T. On the pitcher's mound, Rhodes scholar Zujasha Takir. In the bullpen, Joseph Camarada, Barium Goldwater Scholar, and Funleo Easterwood, Fulbright Hayes Grant recipient, and designated hitters, Math for America fellows, Gian Liu and Anne Marie Alcocer. CUNY All Stars, like the Yankees, our hometown champions.
For over 150 years, this legendary East Village establishment has offered ale and spirits. McSoy's Old Ale House is famous for many ghosts, particularly Harry Houdini, the great illusionist or escape artist of the 1920s. It's just one stop on a very unusual walking tour. This Queens College alumnus and former Queens College history professor says the paranormal pays. I'm Dr. Philip Ernest Schoenberg, the creator and founder of Ghosts of New York, a company that specializes in a whole series of services of supernatural kind, from walking tours to getting rid of the ghosts in your home. The difference between a poltergeist and a ghost is that a ghost is usually a person, and poltergeists, they're usually seen and not heard, so they move things around um, and they play tricks on people. Dr. Schoenberg operates 16 different versions of his ghostly New York tours, and... We have ghost walks in New Haven, Connecticut, and we have ghost walks in Palm Beach, Florida as well. Dr. Schoenberg researches and writes the scripts, and then hires professional guides to conduct the tours, like Amada Anderson. We're standing in front of St. Mark's Church in the Bowery, which is known to be haunted by Peter Stuyvesant, the first Dutch colonial governor of New Amsterdam, New York. He has a family mausoleum on the side, and to this day, Peter Stuyvesant can still be heard in the church, walking down the aisles with his peg leg going, step, 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 step. I started doing walking tours in 1995. I had worked as an intern at the Queen's Historical Society. I realized it was more profitable to do walking tours of Manhattan and Queens. The overhead is not so low. In a way, it's labor intensive. Uh, I have a large telephone bill. I, have, uh, I also have to pay for websites of various kinds. This is more an avocation for you, or it's not your main business? This is my main business. Right now, I'm planning to expand to Washington, D.C., and I'm working with two of my nephews to accomplish that. Ghosts are people, too. And if you were to pass away and something happened to your house that you lived in for 100 years, you might be upset. So you kind of have to think about it that way. And then there's the idea that ghosts are troubled and that they don't, they don't know that they're dead. I'm what? Some say ghosts haunt a place because they have unfinished business. So how's business? One advantage of doing, having your own business is you can do things creatively, that you could change things, that you could have different offerings. Also get instant gratification because if you're successful, people show up and pay you money. A toast to the ghost and the ghost walks of New York. Barry Mitchell, study, study with the best. First. Someone had to be first. Somebody had to be first to see the ships. Someone had to be first to be chained. Someone had to be first to be put in the coffle. Someone had to be first to be branded. Somebody had to be first to be sold. Someone had to be first to fight for freedom. Someone had to be first to be free. Somebody had to be first to ask the question, why can't I do this? Because of this, because of this, because of this. Somebody had to be first to sing that note. Somebody had to be first to make that film. Somebody had to be first to dance that dance. Somebody had to be first to ask the question, why can't I have an education? Somebody had to be first to make their mama proud. Somebody had to be first to make their daddy strong. Somebody had to be first to make their child smile. Somebody had to be first to get off the back of the bus. Somebody had to be first to go to the voting ballot. Somebody had to be first to drink from the fountain. Somebody had to be first to be cut off the tree. Somebody had to be first to get elected. Somebody had to be first to say, yes, I can. Yes, I will. And yes, I can do. So you're going to be first, or you're going to be last. Show of hands, anyone not feel up to the test?
CKCA, the Center for Kosher Culinary Arts. We have previewed hundreds upon hundreds of entries, and we have whittled it down to what we feel is the best three contestants. Our challenges include brain work, hand-eye coordination. We have speed challenges. Our contestants will be given a basket of ingredients that no one knows till now. And they will have to create a masterpiece in under 30 minutes. The winner is going to receive a $5,000 scholarship for the professional class at the Center for Kosher Culinary Arts. Hi, Batsheva. Ready for our next challenge? What we're going to ask you to do is smell secret items and identify them. Let the challenge begin! Celery. It's a celery. Celery? Licorice. A fennel. Oh, fen uh, uh, Kimmel. Wine? What's just that? It's like a spice, uh, a pop oh, cayenne. Hot sauce. Lemon, lime, lime. Uh, lemon. Lemon, lime. lime. It's a uh, oregano. Uh, thyme. Radish. I don't smell any of those. Grapes. Jam, jam. Shit. I don't know. Apricot. I never eat cilantro. Barbecue. Uh, soy sauce. Wait. Sorry. Oh. oh, it totally went into my nose. I couldn't. Okay. Whatever. I don't even know those <laughs> in front of me. Egg? People are more particular about their eggs than any other style of food. You are going to have 10 minutes to make as many orders as Fried eggs over easy. You will receive no points for any eggs that have broken yolks. Slide them onto your plate. Garnish. Do a little bit of ground fresh pepper and salt. And this is your demonstration complete. We're going to ask Chef Camille to start a clock on your mark, please. I'll be ready. Let's go. Goes my lunch, young lady. I do agree, Chef. Let's move right along. And then we have five masterful ones, Bacheva. How are we doing, Yasmin? Good. So we 
got six good ones here. The winner of this challenge. When I finished and I saw that Sheva had like 10 plates, I was like, oh, all right, I, I, I failed. Nobody likes it. The worst brand for people. I didn't cut myself, so that was a market improvement. <laughs> Well, that's our show. As usual, if you want to find out more about CUNY, log on to cuny.edu. If you want to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, look for us at, at CUNY TV. Well, I'm out. Your surprise ingredients are about to be revealed. Ladies and gentlemen, start your engines. Time is ticking down very quickly.